Good evening, everyone. Really glad to be back with you again. And I'm uh, extremely pleased to have dragged back to, to talk to me again um, Matt Errett, who's the editor in chief of the Canadian Patriot Review, senior fellow at the American University in Moscow, the author of the Untold History of Canada book series and Clash of the Two Americas. And in 2019, Matt, you founded the Montreal based Rising Tide Foundation. You've also published the book, The Time Has Come for Canada to Join the New Silk Road. And um, if people want to go to our previous podcast, which is at my website, thewallwillfall.org, um, entitled Breaking the Extinction Cycle from COVID to Ukraine with Matt Edit. Matt, welcome back. Hey, thank you, Vanessa, for having me back on. It was a pleasure last week, and I'm really happy to do <laughs> that conversation. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, we could have probably gone on for about three hours, but um, yeah. I, I think it was good to have ended on the positive note that we ended on. And, and it was nice, actually, that in the comments, I, I did actually get quite a lot of positive feedback and people felt um, encouraged um, by what you were saying. So, um, you know, I, I think that's very important at this moment in time because we are going through, I believe, um, a transformational period in, in history. Um, and that is always packed full of uncertainty. Um, and for many people, huge difficulty. So, I, you know, I think it's important to try and bring realistic positivity, positivity mm -hmm. um, to mm -hmm. the discussion. Um, one of the things that we didn't really get into um, in too much depth in our last conversation was um, we were addressing the issue of whether Russia and China are part of the transnational global plutocracy um, leading the Great Reset agenda that um, many believe was, was brought in or ushered in by the COVID-19 project, which of course started back in um, March 2020. Um, <clears throat> and you have argued on a number of panels uh, and on a number of occasions very eloquently, very articulately, and with a huge amount of knowledge and history that this is not the case, that uh, Russia and China and uh, a number of other countries, namely Iran, India, Pakistan, many of the uh, Central African Republic countries, many Middle Eastern countries, uh, Latin American countries, are effectively working towards um, a non-aligned block. In other words, um, decoupling from Western supremacy and unipolarity, namely, of course, dominated by the United States. But I would also put the UK in there very much so. Um, so I wanted today to, to to dive more into what we, we touched on last time, which is the effect of the fifth column in both Russia and China. And to start with, can you give a description to the audience of what exactly a fifth column is, who is usually in control of it, and what it is designed to do? Yes, most certainly, yeah. Um, so the the term uh, fifth column uh, has increasingly become I, people I think in our, our world, especially since 2016, have been more comfortable with the terminology of deep state as as an idea that is really, I think, a new but useful concept in the lexicon um, of most of most people in who are aware of what's going on in the world. There, there's an idea now that there is something other than um, national interest so that you have forces within various governments of the world. I think every government of the world has elements that are not in allegiance with that particular nation that they happen to operate within, within embedded within the civil service, within the bureaucracy, within the military, within academia, within media, within intelligence, um, as different sort of aspects of the same thing. And we have penetrations of um, this thing you might call a deep state um, everywhere in the world. The before that term came about, it was more conventional to utilize the term fifth column um, as that sort of treacherous branch of within and embedded within government uh, institutions that would work for the subversive interests of uh, 
I mean, the question is who is controlling fifth columns? Who is controlling these these tentacles? That's that's always up for debate historically. Different people have different idea of who who is controlling them during the Cold War. You know, many Americans believed that uh, it was Russian and Chinese communists who were controlling their spies and and agents within their government. And many Russians and Chinese uh, believed, you know, that it was entirely the Americans controlling their spies um, embedded within their governments. Now, I would say that neither one of those views throughout the Cold War was actually really correct. Um, when you actually look at world history, and especially the, the 20th century, um, you really can't get anywhere if you don't take into consideration the existence of an oligarchy above nation states, so that there is a power, a shadow government of, of that you might want to call it that, above national institutions, utilizing, as it always has, a, a vast control of finance, of intelligence um, operations, um, and a variety of other things that has always been there. And there, there is a continuity. And, and this is what I use in my, my historical research in the back of my mind. I'm always cons- holding for context the existence of an oligarchical system that transcends individual generations or lifetimes, which goes back really to the collapse of Rome and maybe even before that, um, as far as certain families, certain bloodlines that are kept in a dominant position and around which all authority and hered- hereditary structures of power emanate from uh, one generation to the next. And this is something which, again, is really brushed out or scrubbed out of most modern historical analysis, because, you know, this this leads us into the dangerous and, and forbidden <laughs> domain of conspiracy thinking, um, which is a sign that you have a mental dysfunction or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, but the reality is, I, I think that th- this this is an important um, principle a causal nexus of history and, and, and the 20th century, especially the cold war was no exception. So uh, Russia has their own fifth columns and Putin has recently spoken openly about this, even in March 15th. Um, very, very clearly, um, which I even have his little quote. I was might even read it uh, for the, for the people listening, maybe. Yeah. Go for you, it. Yeah. You don't mind. Okay. Yeah, no, it's just, it's such a good, strong quote. And I, mm. and it's rare to hear statesmen today, speaking so candidly and i think he's been more um you know putin is somebody who's kept his his cards close to his chest for much of the 22 plus years he's been um a power player so it's it's um i think now with the events in ukraine being what they are and obviously fissures that putin and and i think many of his his collaborators in china and and, and around russia have been trying to keep from from splitting too terribly apart um there's sort of a no going back in some ways um, with sanctions, with everything else happening. So I think he's now speaking a lot more candidly. And, and in this attack on the Russian fifth column, he said on March 15th, yes, of course, the West will bet on the so-called fifth column, our national traders, on those who earn money here with us, but live there. And they live there not even in the geographical sense of the word, but according to their thoughts, according to their slavish consciousness. Many of these people, by their very nature, are mentally located exactly there and not here, not with our people, not with Russia. This is, in their opinion, a sign of belonging to a higher caste, a higher race. Such people are ready to sell their own mothers if they were allowed to sit in the hallway of this very highest caste. They do not understand at all that if they are needed by the so-called higher caste, then they are needed only as expendable material in order to use them to inflict maximum damage on our people. That's the end of, it's a longer, much longer in, interview. And mm. I took a small quote, but I thought it was just very powerful. No, no, I mean, it was a very powerful um statement by him and the entire speech and you're absolutely right I think and I think this is the mistake um, or maybe this is what some of these people are overlooking these analysts and researchers for whom I have a huge amount of respect like um, Ian Davis who was on the panel which um, Whitney uh, Webb was uh, hosting along with um, Kit Knightley from Off Guardian um, is a lot of the rhetoric prior to February the 24th, 
um, when Russia started its um, limited military operations in Ukraine, um, altered drastically after that date. In other words, you started to, to see a real, in my opinion, um, a real shift in the rhetoric and a, and a real honesty coming through. I'm not saying that they were being dishonest before, but, th but they were being political before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were, um, in, in my opinion, and it'd be interesting to see what you think, I think they were following a strategy to try and um, not appease the West, but to try and form some kind of collaboration or partnership that would benefit um, Russia <laughs> and China. Yes. Um, and I can, you know, on a much smaller scale, but if I go back in history to the early 2000s, for example, when President Assad was effectively being courted by the West because they believed that they could foster a different relationship according to the Bush and Tony Blair um, emails that were revealed after, um, you know, in the Chilcot inquiry into the fraud that was the weapons of mass destruction. Um, Assad at this time also um, was, if you like, uncharacteristically coming towards the West um, and agreeing to the CIA black sites, for example, in Syria post 9-11. Um, but of course, at that time, he, he was combating um, fairly heavy sanctions that had been brought in as a result of um, their um, being against um, the, the 91 Gulf War. Um, mm. um, so, you know, from, from that perspective, I, I have a feeling that a lot of what we saw prior to uh, the conflict in Ukraine was very much geopolitical strategizing. It was, um, and you know, and Russians, <laughs> you know, they are very masterful chess players. I know that's a cliche, but nevertheless, it, it's very true. Um, what's your opinion on that? If, if you compare the language, um, the statements, the rhetoric pre-February 24th, 2022, to after the events took place. Um, yeah, mo most certainly I agree. And I think that we often um, not many people, most people are not anywhere near any actual corridor of real power in uh, the political spectrum. And so it's often easy for us to fall into the trap of, you know, commenting um, and looking upon things from the outside um, without appreciating the actual sophistication and reality of very powerful um structures of power that exist in many nations, that leaders who might have a good intention, a, a good uh, orientation, have to negotiate with and navigate around while trying to stay alive at the same time um, to advance something which is in the benefit of their countries. Mm. So um, th there is, and, and we often, I mean, maybe this is because of our media, our movies, our culture, which tends to overly simplify good and evil, you know, to the comic book idea of Lex Luthor versus Superman. And one is clearly <laughs> evil and one is clearly good. Um, and everyone can see which one is which, you know, there's no need to think about nuance. <laughs> so we tend to, I think, uh, take that stuff that Hollywood gives us and we transpose it in our, into our analysis of, of politics. And then we take Sometimes the fact is, you know, um, bad people will say good things, and they usually do, um, in order to get support from the masses or, or advance their, their own nefarious agenda, but will do the opposite. And sometimes good people will say bad things in order to appease uh, powerful uh, players who are evil, but they will then do something which runs contrary to those words that they used. You know, um, so you really do have to, I think, take the 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 step back sometimes from just what your your eyes and ears are seeing and hearing and look with your mind's eye at the broader uh, context, the, the historical forces, the, the, the higher um, principles that are shaping the conditions and the potential of our world, because we're we're living in potential right now for a lot of chaos and hell on earth and a lot of really good. Uh, incredibly good things that could happen uh, since we are, 
you know, living through the, the collapse of one system and the pre-creation of a new operating system, which will come online. The question is, what will it be? How will that new operating system be wired up, upon what principles of, of operation, what definitions of value, what definitions of human beings, our role in the system? Um, that's underdefined. And there's a fight over what that, that will be. Um, so yeah, when you look at what Putin has done, I mean, he's made a He's somebody who is renowned for having gained and ascended to a very high position um, by getting very bad people, including a lot of Russian oligarchs in the 1990s around Yeltsin, to trust him, to think he was just this pragmatic, uh, you know, cold, calculating ex-KGB guy who would just, you know, look the other way when evil is done, who had no national or, or moral interests in much of anything beyond himself. He got their trust. And then what we could see through his actions <laughs> was systematically pulling the rug out from under the feet of many of these same oligarchs who gave him sponsorship earlier on, many of whom were sent into prison in 2000 and, you know, co court cases were launched against a variety of these figures. Like uh, we saw Mikhail uh, Korkovsky, who uh, was one of these big private uh, privatizing billionaires who, uh, uh, reaped a lot with the help of certain U.S. State Department uh, operatives, George Soros, Victoria mm -hmm. Newland, even being the assistant of Strobe Talbot in the 1990s. So Mikhail Kord Kordakovsky, who ended up owning a Yukos, the biggest oil giant, um, was given prison time for many, many years in 2005. Platon Lebed, another of his these, these oligarchs, was given nine years prison time. He also head, headed uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, groups, uh, Menetap group. That was formed under the uh, the control of um, people like Larry Summers, who was the U.S. running the U.S. Treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many others. I mean, I can go through a big list, but those those who avoided prison were either those who chose to agree with the new rules that Putin laid down, and people can watch some of these very funny um, <clears throat> confrontational meetings Putin had with many of these oligarchs on various occasions. Where in one case, you know, he's trying to uh, get them to agree to reopen a, a factory that is on strike, which they, they're refusing to do because they're all about money. And he says, look, uh, if you don't do this and sign an agreement with the, the workers, we will just go in and nationalize as we've nationalized a lot of things. And uh, one of these oligarchs uh, is just pissed off and he forces him in, in front of the media, the, the cameras to go and sign this contract. And then when the guy like disgruntedly goes, goes and embarrassingly does it. He walks away and Putin's like, hey, that's not your pen. Give me back my pen. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember this like, one. Really drink it. <laughs> um, so you have those people who chose to agree to play by the new rules. Some of them did maybe honestly. Other ones perhaps did just to buy time so that they could subvert things later on from within, which is obviously the case. Um, other ones have just to avoid prison uh, escaped and uh, like Ber Berezovsky went to London. Um, there's a big, uh, you know, Russian oligarch section called Moscow on the Thames where there's these big manors and mansions of, of Russians who avoided prison. It's not like Putin sent them there to infiltrate the West. They went there because they knew that they would be in prison if they stayed in Russia. And you could see that through their actions. Uh, you know, what are, what are the things that these guys also in Florida, there's a lot of Russian oligarchs there um, who reaped a lot of, uh, of money um, by the destruction of the lives of many Russians in the 90s. And many of them have been working with Soros, with other CIA operations to promote open society um, operations in, um, like, I mean, even uh, Korokovsky, who's now out of prison, he's in, I think he's in Britain, and he's running um, an operation to liberalize and promote, you know, liberal thinking in, uh, in Russia from the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's all of these these sorts of things which, you know, Putin has been, it's like a dance with somebody who wants to kill you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese have been dealing with something similar where you have to say certain things for diplomatic purposes. Um, and again, keeping your cards to your chest. And then when the opportunities arise, you take your strikes where you can, and then you pull back, you know, and, and it's this, this is the sort of thing that, that re real politic is based upon. Um, and now that, again, that we've seen 
all of Putin's attempts, and there has been obvious attempts to to reduce the chance of a new Cold War or hot war from breaking out, which is what Putin's been doing since his Munich speech in uh, Germany in 20, 2007, where he was very clearly putting on the table that he understands the Russian, uh, sorry, the NATO agenda of surrounding Russia with anti-ballistic missiles for the sake of, of gaining full spectrum dominance um, over Russia. He put that out there very clearly as awareness and had been trying very clearly to bring about entente with the West to say, look, let's avoid doing things that are going to inflame a total breakdown of East-West relations that could threaten humanity. We saw that with uh, his efforts to try to spark an agreement with uh, the, you know, Yanukovych of Ukraine, where he wasn't demanding that Yanukovych not join the European Union or anything of the sort. He simply said, let's create something whereby Ukraine can have positive economic relations with Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union at the same time as being a member state of the of Europe um, or the European Union and the, the Europe. So he tried, he definitely tried. That was overthrown. That was not accepted. Whereas the, the West was of the view that no, Yanukovych, if you're going to be integrating with us, then you will have no relation with Russia, which is, I mean, it's, it's disastrous because Russia was buying up finished goods they were they were uh, that that market was the basis to justify ukraine's heavy industries that were being hollowed out since the the late 90s or late 80s uh, whereas all europe wanted of ukraine was raw, raw materials resources oil and wheat they didn't want to have them to have industries or or anything that's technologically advanced russia was different so it was china so anyway, that was overthrown, and, and for eight years, Putin has been trying really hard, we could see that, to avoid, again, um, like he hasn't, it's not like he didn't want to recognize the demands of the people in Lugansk or Donetsk for, uh, you know, becoming sovereign nation states. They're mostly Russian anyway, in terms of their identities and language and everything else. They had a, they had a full-blown plebiscite, which is, you know, almost a unanimous, I mean, like 90% of the population voted to become a, an independent independent countries. And it's, so it's not like he didn't want to do that, but he didn't do that. And he was, he continuously tried to defend Min, the Minsk uh, two accords to keep them as parts of Ukraine. Um, as long as Ukraine just simply didn't join NATO and didn't host us missiles as part of the, this full spectrum dominance program. And he, I mean, there's so much effort that he, he tried to do. And it kind of, it came to the point where, like we discussed last week, you know, the, the, there was a lot of evidence that Ukraine was going to go for a full-blown assault, uh, a bloodbath on uh, Crimea and, and East Donetsk, uh, Donbass. And to avoid that bloodbath, uh, Russia did go in. And, and I mean, it was going, there's a lot of evidence at this point that came to the surface that that was going to happen. And I think if it did, if it was permitted, we had the U.S. State Department already, Ned Price, the spokesperson, already laying the groundwork to say that, you know, um, something bad is going to happen. They were preparing the minds of the people of the West to, to understand how they should interpret the oncoming bloodbath. And he said, you know, it's going to happen, but Russia is going to blame Kiev. And, and the reality is they're going to be using crisis actors and it's going to be a false flag run by Russia to justify an invasion, mm -hmm. but uh, don't believe them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously Russia, if they had let this happen, they would have been entering they would have had to have entered Ukraine anyway, no matter what. That was unavoidable mm -hmm. by this time. Yeah. The question is, were they going to stay in a position of influence or were they going to play into a game controlled by those who want to destroy them? So they chose to go in earlier on before the bloodbath, as we've seen. And mm -hmm. since then, yeah, Putin has been more open, let's just say, much more openly candid about who, his understanding of these enemies. He's even uh, passed a, recently um, a presidential order evicting, firing a variety of people from the the, the scientific committee from the uh, Russian Security Council um, who have been Western liberalizers, like Director General um, of Russian International Affairs, Andrei uh, Kortinov, who's also a darling at, at RT, uh, Sergei Rugakov, um, Alexander Panov, like a variety of others who were all mm -hmm. part of this nexus that was built up in the 1990s. So you're, you're seeing now a pushback on uh, at the biggest one, Anatoly Chubai, whom I recently mm -hmm. wrote an article on. He's he's like the king of this fifth column in many ways who worked directly. He was a Soros reformer in the in the 80s and 90s, who was a personal controller and handler of Yeltsin, who oversaw with Yegor Gaidar, 
the um, the privatization, the the um, of everything, right, of of the entire Russian economy uh, during that that terrible uh, period of looting. And he has been protected. It's not like Putin hasn't tried to get rid of him. He's hated him. He's called him a CIA stooge in 2013. But despite that, <laughs> Shubai has something protecting him, as do many mm-hmm. of these characters, um, to the point that he maintained a position at, as the head of Rusnano from 2007 all the way up until 2020. Um, he had recently been made the head of the um, the the ambassador from from Russia to the United Nations on sustainable development. He's one of the key characters who's been bringing in Davos programs mm-hmm. since the 90s into Russia. Uh, the entire Great Reset, Fourth Industrial Revolution idea of of just decarbonizing society with windmills, solar panels, and all of this you know um, stuff. Uh, this is this is really Chubai's work, and Chubai has jumped ship a week ago. He just gave it his announcement saying, "I'm I'm getting out of Russia." Uh, goodbye. And he's tried to make it about his disagreement with the Ukraine uh, uh, conflict. But the reality is, I mean, he I think he heard this speech and it was like a day or two later that he was like, I'm, I'm gone. And he went to Turkey. I don't think he's going to come back. There's many more, many, many more uh, like him. And I think you mentioned in another interview about um, that Shubai, or maybe we talked about it, that Shubai um very much empowered Tatiana Golkova, who was in charge of um, the the health measures basically during um, COVID. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was directly Chubai, but uh, Tatiana Golkova was um, certainly the. I, I mean, she has been somebody as well who was brought into the Ministry of Finance in the nineties. Um, now she is the Deputy Prime Minister and. Uh, you pointed out she has been in charge from the get-go of the whole covid uh you know scandemic whatever whatever people want to call it (laughs) she's been in charge of all of the emergency protocols that's her um she was formally her qualifications was like she's a western trained uh liberal economist who was again brought in in the 90s into the finance ministry to oversee a lot of the perestroika um she was made deputy finance minister um, in 99, she was then made Minister of Health in two, 2007, where she worked very closely with her husband, uh, Victor uh, Kristenko, who's also, he was also Deputy Prime Minister uh, at that same time in 98. He was made the Minister of Industry of Russia for uh, eight years until 2012. And, um, and these are characters who are, again, absolutely ideologically uh, westernized, liberalized to the extreme uh, Kristenko, her husband, is a disciple of a cybernetics guru um, named Georgi, uh, what's his name, uh, Shadrovitsky, who's a highly influential uh, nutcase um, <laughs> who um, <laughs> in the 1950s and 60s created a whole cult following around this idea that there are no such thing as individuals. Individuals have no existence outside of the system of controls, and that is cybernetics. It's the science mm-hmm. of control. Um, in, in fact, if you get behind the Klaus Schwabian Davos ideology uh, of population control, which they really want to bring online mm. as part of this whole great reset, it's rooted in the science of cybernetics that was created at the end of World War II, which is just, again, it's a science of control that most people in the system don't need to understand the system. They just need to be hyper-specialized in a very bureaucrat- bureaucratized, compartmentalized uh, machine, and only a few people called the helmsmen. Um, need to have a sense of the whole, only a few, privileged few. Um, and that's sort of the, the origins of the, the ideology of cybernetics. Um, so these people, they, they are absolute behaviorists. They don't believe in, in the idea of justice or soul or God or sacredness or anything. Those are all abstract, you know, useless terms. For them, it's just control. That's, that's all that's real. It's hyper-materialist, hyper-positivist. Um, and thus for them, and that's why it's so concerning when you look at people like uh, Krishtenko, who's still a power player, and his wife, Tatiana, um, being in the positions that they have been and protected as they have been, um, she, both of them enriched themselves immensely um, under uh, Chubai's period as well, where he gave giant contracts to a variety of uh, pharmaceutical companies in 2008, 2009, 2010, as he was the head of Rosnano, but he was able to then still provide... <laughs> Uh, contracts for the science of uh, pharmaceutical technology that enriched both Golikova, her husband, as she was also uh, you know, Minister of Health. 
they call her the mother, the mother of corruption in uh, Russia. That's that's <laughs> literally what they <laughs> the mother of graft. Um, she had empowered as well uh, German German Greff, who is a high level World Economic Forum trustee um, during the COVID nineteen operation, to um, gain you know uh, powerful, very very lucrative contracts to generate their Sputnik five um, um, formula. The um, the whole thing though, I mean, if you look around that same time, Gaidar. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Chubai had created, uh, upon Gaidar's death, a giant fund to be the uh, Davos of Russia in 2009. It was called the Gaidar Forum that would take place every year, one one week before the World Economic Forum in Davos. And uh, the Gaidar, essentially Davos Forum, was a big part of what brought in the funding. And this is again, what he oversaw as the head of Rosnanos into uh, windmill and solar solar farms in uh, Russia, which today they're very little. Russia uses a lot of natural gas and oil and fossil fuels and that's their main, their main priority. And I think they're, they're not stupid enough as many Western countries in the science of economy and the science of sustaining populations where we've become very ignorant. They know that if you just uh, eliminate all of these hydrocarbon uh, fuel sources, you're going to create mass scarcity, starvation, death, and chaos. Whereas we, being just more uh, shaped by computer model thinking and not reality, we uh, <laughs> make a lot of worse decisions as we see across Europe and North America now with the shutdown, not only of uh, carbon-based forms of fuel, but also even the shutdown of nuclear power, uh, the cancellation of, of investments into uh, new forms of, of fusion power uh, research has been massively undercut. And instead, we're all being told that, oh, we're going to have such a better world if we just go for windmills and solar panels and put our economy on those things, which honestly, you can't even make a windmill with a windmill. You can't make a solar panel with a solar panel energy because all of the industrial um, heat and energy that is required to make these energy intensive um, devices, including the mining as well. Mm. It's so much rare earth mining. You, it's so destructive to, to nature. You yep. can't do that with the, the type of energy you get from windmills or solar panels themselves. So it's mm. the very opposite from renewable energy. You know, that's how it's sold to us. It's really not. So all that to say, yeah, there's this whole network, um, Golikova being a big one. And an, just to get back to your main question, as the head of the COVID response, this has confused a lot of critical thinkers and analysts of the West, I think, trying to look make sense of what Russia's response has been, as mm. well as China, to the, the COVID issue. And they don't get it because there's so much similarity to how Russia and China have been responding um, overhandedly, like with an overbearing response. Mm. And there's too much similarity to how the Western world, which is very obviously under the control of very nefarious actors, has been responding to this, this thing. Um, and they get confused. They're like, well, obviously Russia and China that thus must be in on it. And it's like, not really. If you look at Golikova, one of the key things she did is she devolved political authority from the Kremlin, from the federal authorities down into the regions, as it has happened under World Health Organization protocols everywhere in the world, we, everywhere uh, mm. that we were told. The, the local authorities, the municipal mayors, the, the governors of regions know better. They're on the ground than the those who are in the, the capital of whatever country. And mm. so they have to have the authority to make mandates, whatever they think needs to happen. They should have the authority to do it and bypass the constitutional legal frameworks that exist in most nations. And that's what she enforced. And this is where there's been also in, in China, too, similar things. Um, at various times, conflicts that we've seen many cases of for two years between the federal authorities and people like Golikova has worked very closely with the mayor of Moscow, mm. uh, Sergei Sobyanin. Uh, yeah. um, and, and he's tried at various times to, to punish people with fines for not being vaccinated, for doing a variety of things, as, as have many of the regions. And she has tended to support him. And he's, a promo he's been a, pro a, a proponent for 20 years of this idea of Russia of the regions. This is like the divide to conquer idea of a nation. You you get rid of federal power and you give all power to local control to have mm. a hyper divided nation that's not unified in any meaningful way and thus more able to be economically colonized by an oligarchy, which has always been what that sort of thing has been about. And he's been a proponent of that. And he's also mm. spoken openly about having 
himself presidential ambitions. And he's come mm-hmm. close to becoming prime minister on several occasions. So he's not like a little local mayor. This is a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so Golikova has been protecting him. And, and I think, again, when you look at the amount of fight uh, between the federal and local regions on a variety of, of, of points, including most recently when Golikova announced that the federal government, she said in November 3rd, 2021, she said by February 1st, 2022, she had announced, and Sobyanin uh, reamplified this, that the federal authorities were going to now implement um, and enforce uh, fining people, demanding total vaccination, unquestioning, because there's a very low re- vaccination rate in Russia. People just generally don't believe the bullshit the way we do in the West. <laughs> um, and uh, we saw within three weeks, the Russian uh, federal authorities came out and said, any such thing will have no weight in law. This will not happen. And as we saw, especially since the beginning of February, it has had no weight. It did not happen. There was total pushback. And instead, what we've seen is a, is a massive pullback from a lot of these mandates mm-hmm. that have been underway for two years, especially which accelerated since the Ukraine conflict, where it's I think Putin just realized I'm not playing this game anymore. I don't have to. There's no more advantage <laughs> to trying to play this game of like, OK, we're on board with, you know, uh, what you're saying. Mm. So I think uh, there are a lot of analysts who have made a bit of a career and reputation for themselves in the last several months, especially attacking Russia um, without taking any of this context into consideration, just simply over the myopic examination of their COVID response protocols, who now don't have that much to write about as they used to, because Russia has again pulled back on a lot of these things. And now they're devoting a lot of their attention just to China um, mm. and about how China has been responding, especially in Shanghai with their current lockdown. And the other variable, just to add to that, is the bioweapons. Like, I mean, a, yeah, a I was just the- going to say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So go yeah. Ahead. No, I mean, I, I also, sorry, just wanted to intercede for one second because I also wanted mm-hmm. to say, it's interesting that, that Sobyanin's, um, Sergei Sobyanin's uh, rhetoric has also slightly changed since February the 24th, whether he kind of sees the writing on the wall and is perhaps starting to edge back towards um, or away from the whole kind of Davos Agenda 2030 paradigm, because he's been talking, hasn't he, about... um, um home ownership land ownership um releasing cash um enabling small businesses um etc cetera, etc cetera, in line with with putin's speeches of course about increasing social benefits and protecting the the public from sanctions so um is is he kind of coming back in line with Putin at the moment? Because again, that, that yeah. seems to be a complete switch from what, what obviously, oh, yeah. from, from the entire Agenda 2030 Great Reset, right? Because he's talking yeah. about home ownership, he's talking about land ownership, he's talking about enabling um, private enterprises, um, release, uh, generating cash, uh, supporting uh, local labor, creating jobs, which is complete anathema. Right, to, yeah, to the I think Western-centric he's... view. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't trust him as a moral being, no, but I, I think not. that Putin trusts him <laughs> as far as being somebody who is uh, open to his own self-preservation. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, will, will adapt to whatever uh, allows him to preserve his existence. Um, so to that sense, yeah, I think that uh, he, does, he does intend to carry out something that he knows that if he doesn't, he's out. Um, and, yeah, and I mean, this is um, this is politics. Yeah, exactly. You, know? <laughs> you can't get anything done if you just want to like clear house of everybody corrupt. My God, you're you're oh, done for. You know, you need I mean, yeah, it's just not going to happen. You know? I yeah, mean, I always say to people, even if you don't understand, or or even if you 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 can't put yourself in in a polo- in a political um, environment, you don't fully understand because you've never worked in it. But just think about corporate politics. You know, it's the same thing, only the stakes are much higher, <laughs> right? Um, that than in than in corporate business or industry, anything like that. You'll have the same battles, but yeah. once it get up, once it gets to that level of of power structure, then then the battles become high risk, um, possibly very lucrative, um, and very unstable, and and you have to navigate that. Um, and you know, that, that's 
reality. And I think people, when they are analyzing, do sort of forget um, about this reality. It's a real world. It's it's mm -hmm. it's not. And I re you know, I really don't want to dismiss this analysis out of hand. I've, I, in a in a sense, it's good that it's there because it's making us think. It's making us actually. Um, take it into consideration and examine it, etc. You know that that's that's a good thing. That's a positive. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I mean, for example, I I live here in Syria, and and you know I see to what extent the maneuvering goes on to try and dig this country out of the Western savagery and sadism and and barbarism that has been you know absolutely grinding this country down um for the last 11 years you know people criticized president Assad, for example for 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 going to to meet with the uae because of course the uae is is currently involved <clears throat> um in decimating yemen for example yeah. you know but, but this is real politic in a sense mm -hmm. you 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 it's not that you abandon your principles but you have to you have to have a greater vision you have to be working towards what you want and and those steps that you take towards what you want are not necessarily going to please all the people all the time that's impossible yeah right? and the irony to all of this i think is that for those um more selfish narrow-minded uh, actors who are just in it for money or, or personal <laughs> self-interest at the expense of of the nation they're a part of and the people mm. the irony is that if they go along with the sort of thinking uh that we see at, like from the the economic orientation of china or russia regarding look at putin's uh and and i mean people like lavrov and and uh, uh shoigu and, and many other nationalists and patriots look at their initiatives that what they want to do and have openly spoken about and have tried to do and done to a certain extent but not as much as they want to of mm. opening up the arctic and siberia to real massive development since it's super underdeveloped it's like, it's like canada in many ways except um yeah just the resource potential the development potential is so big it's tied also increasingly to the a northern branch of the belt and road initiative what's called the polar silk road so, I mean, they would make so much money if they went along with these sorts of projects of building large scale infrastructure the way China has been doing for the past eight years mm. um, around the world, not just in China, pulling people out of poverty, but creating new markets, creating new technologies, new resource bases by introducing it's 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 like a central control, but it's it's got a what's it, what um, uh, Glaziev. The, Putin's advisor who's gaining hegemony or not hegemony, but he's on the ascendancy right now in terms of his political influence currently. Um, he's made he's made this very clear that China has tapped into the balance of central command, but at the same time with flexible management structures economically, because you have to have both change and no ch like you have to have the ability to harmonize the, the various parts of, of a complex system, which is a nation, but also a, a community of nations working together that requires a harmonization of action. So you do have to have central uh, command abilities. You do have to have a national bank the way China does have a, a state-controlled bank. They didn't let theirs, their banking system become privatized mm. the way the rest of the world has under private central banks. And especially, you know, like Russia in the, in the 90s, their bank of, of, of Russia was um, re-constitutionalized under a privatized central banking structure beholden to the IMF and Western financiers. And it operates not for the benefit of the Russian people or the nation, whereas China is different. That's how they can get a lot of things done. They can emit large scale credit, you know, with 10, 20 year maturities, very low interest for projects that are very specific, mm. right? Um, not speculation. It's not a floating exchange rate type of idea of just speculating on the yuan or on a commodity without a concern for what are you building? So they're able to do like they've been able to build 40,000 kilometers of high speed rail. They're going to double that in a short enough period of time. Um, they've become like leading cutting edge innovators and in all of the things that the West used to be um, pioneers of, China has like leapt ahead and are doing things that no human being has ever done before in quantum computing and high speed rail, maglev rail, space tech, nuclear fusion, all sorts of things. Um, and they're helping other countries. This is the other thing, you know, for those who say that China 
is a part of the Great Reset. Um, just keep in mind that the Great Reset core religious doctrine is stripping nations of their economic sovereignty and stripping the ability mm -hmm. of humanity to support its people through a deindustrial orientation. That's that's what the shutdown of food uh, is all about. The food production right now, farmers are getting paid all over North America to destroy their crops, and they're getting paid 50% more than the market value of their crops. And they're being threatened with fines and punishment by the federal authorities, by Biden, if they don't do that by having their next year's uh, loans withheld. So it's like, there's a massive intention right now with similar things in Europe to destroy food production, to allow only those food productions that are in conformity with the Bill Gates sort of way of thinking about a GMO Monsanto type of operation, and uh, and to go for only forms of energy that are compatible with a deindustrialized uh, green economy, a, a society that cannot sustain more than maybe 10% or maybe 20% of what it currently has as far as people. Mm. Um, so there's that that aspect, whereas China is doing the opposite. Just look at what they're doing. They're involved. They're building full spectrum economies with industrial factories and manufacturing, and also training for Africans and other people in other countries of Asia to train generations of highly specialized engineers to continue the work of maintaining and improving upon those things being built as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and other things. The, look at the energy that Russia and China both are offering to African na nations like Egypt um, and many others to help them develop their own sovereign uh, nuclear energy systems, which has been foreboding um, for many, many years. The only one country in Africa allowed, permitted to have nuclear power is South Africa, which it was allowed only because of it being under white apartheid rule for much of the Cold War. And so they were allowed to have that. But Black Africa, there is a technological racist apartheid against most of Africa uh, based on this um, imperial agenda that most people are not fully appreciative of, where Africa is, has been told since the 50s, no, you might want Kwame Nkrumah or Patrice Lumumba or, you know, name, it, name a, a Pan-African nationalist who gets assassinated. <laughs> um, but, but you might want, they're told, to have advanced technology like we do. But in reality, that's too antithetical to your natural, uh, savage, tribal ecosystem lifestyle. And so we will allow you to have appropriate technologies. Who determines what's appropriate? <laughs> it's the same people who want to destroy Africa, who want to keep them enslaved yeah. and steal their resources, who say, you can have windmills. That doesn't disrupt your ecosystems. Or intelligence. You have to have a very advanced education system to produce people who can maintain upon and improve a nuclear energy economy and you can let's say if you have solar panels all over africa the way you know biden and ursula van der Leyen are, are, are drooling over for their build back better green new deal for the world all it requires educationally for africans is like whatever knowledge you need to be a squeegee to to wipe them clean every day from the dust storms <laughs> um and as that electricity is then sent to uh to europe as, as an energy colonialism. Mm. And none of that benefits the Africans. So China's doing the opposite. They're actually helping these countries develop high-speed rail in uh, Kenya, in uh, Congo, in uh, you know the Addis Ababa uh, to Djibouti rail line, which could feasibly even connect into uh, Yemen if we can maintain this peace process. Mm. Um, and, it, and it requires, again, working with people who are uh, who have done bad things throughout the ages of globalization. You know, a lot of the African leaders didn't that that are that are migrating or, or changing they could smell where the future is going they could see that the west that they're holding to is collapsing faster and faster it's not something very attractive to be a part of and they see that's an, an actual viable offer is on the table for them to have a future and so they you know on one level some of them are just doing it because they're going to make a lot of money by industrializing and working mm -hmm. with china Others just realize maybe some of them actually are, are having a change of heart as deeper quality, you know, human beings. Maybe that's happening. And, and I, I'd like to think it does. Like Abraham Lincoln said, you know, when he was asked, why are you surrounding yourself with all of these people who've wanted to destroy you, your career for so long? And he's like, look, uh, people get cynical and they're like, you know, he, he was all about keeping your your enemy or your friends closer and, and your enemies closer. But he, he had a different, more sublime view. He was a creative, very strong uh, human being. And he made the point that, look, I... I uh, 
I destroy my enemies by turning them into my friends. <laughs> Uh, that paradigm works. It really does. And you can see that after he died, even some of those political enemies that he had surrounded himself with for four years, some of them actually continued to fight for his policies against the U.S. deep state that had started taking over control of the U.S. after his murder. Um, so it does it does work. I think human beings, you have to have a sense. Ultimately, you know, we're, we're born fundamentally good. And somewhere along the way, you know, uh, we can get go off the rails and go onto the wrong path. But because we have we're corrupt like you know augustine had this this beautiful proof in his in his writings um that the fact that we can either institutions or individuals can be corrupted is only proof that we're ultimately good and he's saying this in, op in opposition to those who say that you know <laughs> human beings are born evil right to be controlled by a, a a priesthood or something and he's like no because if if we were born evil there would be no meaning to the word corruption we just would be what we are but mm -hmm. the fact that we all acknowledge that things can be corrupted means that there was something good at the, the root. And that in, includes, like I said, both institutions, which act corrupted, like the UN and UN and Ch uh, Russia and China both confuse, again, a lot of jaded uh, Western analysts because they often speak well about the need to, re to base international law, not on a rules-based order, but on the principles of the UN Charter. And, and a lot of people you know, who are good researchers, I think good-hearted people like James Corbett and others, I uh, will say, aha, look, they talk about the UN Charter, the UN, that's the one world government institution. Um, <laughs> thus, they're all, they're bad. And it's like, well, if you actually look at the UN Charter from 1945-46, you start seeing that in the Charter is signs of something viable. Like there was some original idea that enshrines the sovereignty of nation states. Hmm in the charter it's not a one world government it's it's embedded on the premise that every nation is sovereign that there can be no military aggressive intervention from one country onto another um it's it, there's a lot of enforcement of the concept of the the win-win cooperation you know the the harmonization of of economic activity that benefits all players not zero sum game so these are all viable things if they're actually followed and the problem has just been for eight, 70 80 years that the un has been taken over yeah. by forces who who will just corrupt and, and undermine any they'll turn everything to shit so yeah, yeah know, and in fact they've there. just there's, um there's... you know for all of russia being part of the club the unga has just suspended russia's participation in the U unhrc um i guess with it with the view to um um you know go after them for the alleged um busha massacre so, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to that because I want to talk about um, <laughs> the various clubs that Russia has definitely not been allowed to join, which, which also, in my view, sort of mm -hmm. um, contradicts a little this, this narrative that, that they are a part of uh, the Western-centric technocracy. Um, I mean, I think uh, just after the, the, the Western orchestrated or the US orchestrated, um, coup in Ukraine in 2014, um, in Putin's speech at the Valdai Club in October 2014, he mentioned the fact that the talks on Russia's accession to the um, WTO lasted 19 years. <laughs> you know, um, when Putin spoke to, to Clinton, wasn't it? That came out fairly recently in 2000. And he asked him if if Russia would be allowed to to join NATO, and there was simply no answer. So he was rebuffed, um, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 I think that these are very important um, yardsticks to 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 see how Russia has in fact been ostracized, um, in my view, from from this power base. Um, and, and now we're seeing that becoming even more apparent. But I want to go back because I'm sorry, I interrupted you when you were about to talk about the, the bio labs um, and the fact that these, um, I mean, in Ukraine, um, the bio labs are obviously close to the borders with Russia. But equally, the US has established these so called um, defensive bio labs. <laughs> um, on the borders with Iran and with China. And I think you were, you were going to perhaps make the connection with the Chinese and Russian response to COVID as perhaps having some relation to the potential threat 
um, from these bio labs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other thing. Yeah, I mean, the important thing, and I to keep in mind is that from the from the the mindset and thinking of of the Russian and Chinese intelligentsia, uh, they have been looking at this entire pandemic period from the very start as a potential launching of a U.S. Uh, generated racially specific or racially targeted uh, pathogen. Mm. They are not stupid. You know, they have been looking, they've been following very closely, especially since the uh, September 20, 2000 uh, Rebuilding America's Defenses report written by Paul Wolf Wolfowitz, um, um, I think the brother of uh, Victoria Newland's uh, Robert Kagan, and a variety of other neocons as, as part of the project for New American Century. And in it, I mean, it, it's very clear, they're explicit that the warfare of the 20th cent, 21st century will take on a utilization of, of ethnic targeted pathogens. That's literally what they say on top of cyber warfare and, and other things, all to stop at all costs the rise of any opposition uh, blocks to U.S. Germany, Iran number three. Um, so, you know, the Chinese have been looking at this uh, development for a long time. We saw this thing grow massively after the false flag anthrax attack in December 2001. And the, which was again, you know, some low level FBI associated character working at Fort Detrick was thrown under the bus and blamed for being the, 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 the guy, you know, radicalized by Al Qaeda videos to send these things there, I and mean, there's been a lot of documentation that this was an inside job that said nothing this guy was a, a patsy um but it did justify the buildup of things like the bio shield act of 2004 under cheney and uh, victoria newland together um other road scholars like because i mean wrote there's so many road scholars over this story but um you, you have um uh oh geez i'm forgetting now uh, uh forgetting names sorry but the bio <laughs> shield act was it was a $50 billion, it created a $50 billion budget specifically for the creation and maintenance of an international array, not just of the 11 BSL-4 labs inside of the US, but internationally, what has now come to the surface, I didn't realize it was so many, the Chinese foreign ministry estimates over 300 US uh, bio labs, which have all the capacities of uh, weaponizing pathogens. Um, many of them, as we've come to discover, have been in uh, Ukraine. Many of them are around China's perimeter. And, and again, China has been operating under this basic DEFCON 2 uh, procedure. DEFCON 1 is like nuclear war imminent. DEFCON 2 is the step before that. I think Russia has been in a similar mind state. Um, Lavrov and many other Russian leaders have spoken out openly about their concerns since 2016. I've been seeing the, the, the early, but maybe there's earlier remarks, warning of their concern of the Georgian and Ukrainian U.S. Uh, Pentagon funded bioweapons labs. Which, I mean, the more you look at this stuff, right, the, the, you start seeing that the same figures who are behind the growth of the Nazi operations like Azov's and IDAR in, uh, in Ukraine um, are also all over the, the bioweapons um, growth, including people like Hunter Biden, who made a fortune um, at Burisma, the biggest natural gas yeah. company, which is owned under two shell companies by uh, Kolomoskoy. Igor Kolomoskoy, the, the mm. Ukrainian Israeli billionaire. Um, but also, this guy has, uh, through this laptop that we've now been told, okay, it was real the whole time, there's material on there demonstrating that his, uh, his company, Rosemont Seneca, had provided the seed capital and funding for Metabiota, which has been the contractor maintaining these bio labs in, the, in Ukraine. Um, so you see all of this stuff sort of circling all around the same nasty set of, of low-level characters um, on so many levels. And Kolomoskoy is the also, I, I know you've written about this and, mm. and spoken about this, but one of the biggest backers and financiers behind the Azovs, despite the fact that he's Israeli, um, he doesn't care. He, he's not a, he has no loyalty to the Israeli people. Um, he's more than happy to watch you know, his own people burn and die. Uh, on behalf of a higher power that he's beholden to and will do anything to, uh, uh, you know, advance that. He has no, you know, he's one of these like useful mercenaries, kind of like Soros. He doesn't yeah. care uh, about anything but the power and privilege that you know, he can get. 
So these guys are, mm-hmm. are, are all over this, this operation. And it's really just important to keep that parasite in mind because that's what the Russians have been looking at. Um, they've taken over, as far as I could tell, uh, control of, of the 30 or so bio labs in mm-hmm. Ukraine, which Victoria Newland, you know, had said, these are bio research facilities when we control them, but when Russia owns them, then all <laughs> of a sudden we can call them bio weapons <laughs> facilities. Mm-hmm. Um, China, I think as well, you know, like the fact that the Larry Romanov is a, a Canadian who's a professor in China has been based there for 20 years. He's written extensively, very fascinating reports. I couldn't recommend them enough on, um, on specifically the issue of of China's response to uh, COVID. Mm. And he made a point that for the first, I think it's the first month up until like the end of February of 2020, uh, only Chinese, Han Chinese uh, people first in in, uh, Wuhan and around that province were the only ones to actually suffer from COVID. And, and also then when it began to somehow leap, it, is, it skipped the mainland because they locked down the province in which uh, Hubei province, they locked it down. So there was no more traces of anybody outside of Hubei in China getting or acquiring COVID for many weeks. And then all of a sudden, despite it not spreading beyond Hubei, it made it all of a sudden to the United States. <laughs> like, how did it make mm. that leap? And then yeah. to some places in Europe and, and Canada. And it's like, these were all Han Chinese people in Canada, in the US, in Europe, for the first, all, all the way up, he makes the point until February. Um, and then other variations began to uh, spring forth that targeted Iranians uh, aggressively. We don't know what these things are. We're being, you know, it, the the, the mm. information control was very top down, um, but it's, it's all very anomalous. And I think whatever is going on in Shanghai right now, um, whatever the, the narrative is that they're going along with, um, as far as accommodating the the World Health Organization narratives, mm-hmm. is one thing. But I think when you actually look at how China's been thinking about this and acting, they're I think uh, very much on the uh, scenario that something that their intelligence agencies have given them insight that there is a deployment of something that is targeting the financial nerve center where 26 million people live in Shanghai um, as part of a, a bio warfare attack. So there's that. Um, so all mm, of these things think, are, are increasingly coming to the surface. Yeah, that's interesting. I think Alex Grainer, I also heard him um, expound that that theory on oh, a, on an good. interview with um, Jesse Zurawal quite recently. Mm. Um, also, um, you mentioned uh, Soros, who, of course, um, not only Soros was banned from Russia in 2015, but any NGOs with, well, in fact, there was a law against foreign NGOs, basically, wasn't there? Yeah, 20, uh, 2015 was uh, the, big, the big onslaught in Russia to mm. uh, expel all of Soros's operations. If you were to try to reset something up that was tied to any of his open society operations, mm. you would go, it's, it's, it's uh, illegal, you would go to prison. Um, and a variety of other foreign-backed uh, agencies, NGOs, were also illegalized in 2015. Before that, uh, you know, it took them a while to get around to actually having the ability to do that. Because again, it's not like like Putin did not want to do that. But again, something just to appreciate the structures of real power that do exist protecting these treacherous operations were very strong. And it was it took them all the way till 2015 to do it. Um, China was able to do it much earlier, 26 years earlier, in fact. Yeah. And that's another thing I think a lot of anti-China haters uh, have to sort of, they tend to run away from some of these paradoxes. <laughs> and they don't think about it enough. Like, but yeah. why did China, if, if, if George Soros had so much power in China to the point that he even co-controlled a think tank, one of the biggest economic liberalizing think tanks with the the head of the Chinese Communist Party himself, Zhao Ziyang, was like the guy who co-ran this uh, with Chen Yitzi, his assistant, this think tank with Soros, all the way up until 1989. Why did Soros get banned? Why did uh, Chen Yitzi uh, go to prison? Why did Zhao Ziyang get stripped of all of his power and get put under house arrest for 15 years until he died? Um, why did his operatives who worked with this network, this deep state fifth column in China, who were also giving speeches calling for the fifth industrial revolution in 1983, I said fifth, fourth industrial revolution in 1983, what, why did they all either have to 
many went to prison, many escaped through Operation Yellowbird via the Hong Kong triads coordinated by MI6 and CIA. This is even on Wikipedia. I'm not giving secret information here. <laughs> um, out of, uh, of Tiananmen Square and, in, and out of Beijing and into safer territory in California, Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, this is part of what I think if people began to look a little bit behind things like Epoch Times and Falun Gong and uh, Li Hongji, the, uh, the, this weird cultish head of, of uh, this kind of like, you know, Falun Gong is sort of like the Scientology of Asia. This guy's speeches to CNN, even in 1999, he's very clear. He sees himself as a messiah who's uh, keeping the equilibrium from an international, interdimensional battle of aliens uh, <laughs> trying to... He thinks that, and he—that's what he tells people when you when you get higher up. It's not just a meditation group. Mm. Um, this is obviously it has all of the earmarkings of an intelligence agency cult deployed mm. to undermine uh, target nations, which is why China banned them in 1997. And this is what I think is behind it's the it's these foreign, ex, you know, the, 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 these these people who had uh, avoided arrest in '89, who have been based as a foreign nucleus against the China pushing Soros color revolution ever since um utilizing all sorts of psyops that are very attractive to a lot of right wingers and, and uh conservative types who are suspicious especially of things like great reset but rather than seeing the causal hand of anglo-american intelligence and what this this thing actually is they're being deflected in a bit of a smoke and mirrors operation much like is what happened to many people who are followers of john birch society literature in the 1950s and 60s during the cold war they're being deflected to see that, yes, there is this conspiracy. Yes, it's out to destroy traditional values. That's all true. But it's really the Chinese, the big bad guys are the Chinese or the Russians who are the ones who are a bit of both, who are actually the at the heart of evil. Mm -hmm. And they don't see mm -hmm. that. No, the actual hand <laughs> behind this yeah. is the same which carried out provably the assassinations and murders of all of the American presidents who died while in office, all eight of them, plus Bobby Kennedy. It's a mm -hmm. supranational financier oligarchy. It's been around for a long time. It's had fifth columns in the USA, what you could consider stay behinds. <laughs> After 1776, some of them went <laughs> and uh, went to British territory in Canada. That's why there's English speakers like me in Canada. It's not just a little French colony of Quebec like it used to be in 1776. They were given sanctuary. They were given, you know, they, they were the United Empire loyalists. They didn't want to uh, go with the, the idea that no, all men are created equal and that government should be founded upon the consent of the governed. They disagreed with that. They liked the old hereditary structures of power that they were beholden to, much like the Russian oligarchs like Chubai today, um, or, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And some of them didn't leave to Canada. Some of them stayed behind and some obeyed, uh, you know, obeyed by the new rules of Ben Franklin in Washington and others who actually wanted to create something genuine. And some of them went along with the new, the new rules of the game. Other ones only went along to the degree that they could subvert it from within as, again, a fifth column stay behind. And this includes people like Aaron Burr, who assassinated Alexander Hamilton in 1804, who tried to um, three conspiracies that he was caught guilty for, one of which he even went to trial for until he escaped to Canada uh, to, to carve up the United States into uh, to northern and southern or north, southern and eastern uh, western confederacies with him as the king. Um, all pulled into the British. And there's, he was again caught in one of these conspiracies directly. And he's celebrated today, keep in mind, as a hero. Now, he is the guy who is the founding father of Wall Street. He's the guy who used taxpayer money in 1799 to uh, create the Bank of Manhattan instead of putting it towards building a water, a water system the way he was supposed to. And he was <laughs> vice president of the time. So he was able to do whatever he wanted. He created this private Bank of Manhattan. That became the basis for what later became J.P. Morgan and Chase Manhattan. Um, all of Wall Street and the entire hive of traders inside of the USA, these, these up, you know, we, what were called Boston Brahmins, the Boston <laughs> banking families and of New England and New York, they were all working in his nexus. These are like the Chubais, right? Uh, the Anatoly Chubais. Mm -mm. Yeah, exactly. Guiders. And yeah, the whole time running assassinations of Lincoln, of uh, uh, William Harrison in 1840, who tried to revive Hamiltoni the Hamilton's National Bank, um, had the legislation passed in Congress and Senate, and then right before he could sign it into law to gain back control of a national bank instead of having the private financiers with their, their Wall Street assets controlled by London in the city of London, which even then was the center of world finance, just like it is today. 
before he could sign into law, after three months of being president, he dies for no good reason. And then, you know, Zachary Taylor dies 10 years after that, who's also trying to revive this policy. And then Lincoln dies with his murderer deployed from Montreal, Canada, a British base of operations for the Confederacy, you know, and I mean, I can go through every single example. Mm-hmm. And that's why I wrote my books. Uh, to just show <laughs> yeah. This case thing. All yeah. the way to JFK, whose murderer was deployed from Montreal through Permindex, Permindex which is a Montreal based corporation uh, that had been caught carrying out two attempted assassinations of De Gaulle. Um, th- this is an assassination bureau and Jim Garrison, the district attorney of new Orleans even wrote about this extensively. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there's always been this Anglo Canadian operation with branches in the USA, with branches all over Europe, with branches in Russia <laughs> that got more power after, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet union. And also they, they had branches in China, but the Chinese actually expelled and destroyed this whole Soros fifth column thing. Like Soros, people think of him as the big bad guy. And it's like, well, wait a minute. It's, and they say, oh no, he couldn't be a stooge for Britain because look at what he did to the British pound. He made a billion dollars in a day by betting against the pound in what was it, 1991 or 92, mm-hmm. 92. And okay, well, you could say that, or you could say, well, the British uh, had a good excuse to not join uh the euro system like they they didn't Mm. they kept control of their their pound sterling yeah and even though they'd been pretending they were going to join the maastricht treaty all the way up until that point their excuse was well look we have too much economic chaos because of this uh, because of Soros, so now we can't do it but we'll join later we promise never happened (laughs) they they were never going to get into the cage that they wanted their victims to go into they knew it was always designed to explode (laughs) and soros got his whole money his capital came from uh, I think it was Evelyn de Rothschild in 1968 who gave him all of the money that he needed to start Quantum Hedge Fund, um, the world's first hedge fund, as a pirate mercenary deployed in the age of you know liberalization and deregulation to destroy nations by speculating on currencies. Mm. So this is the sort of thing that was done to China. They were destroyed. They had a one-child policy forced onto them by the Club of Rome, which yeah. was the thing that was at the heart of its computer models for population control were at the heart of the Davos creation in 71. And the Club of Rome is what was, they brought their computer models into China using Song Jian, a, a, a leading cyberneticist, um, just like this guy I mentioned earlier um, from Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, remember Georgi uh, Shedrovitsky? <laughs> These cyberneticists, they're just, they, they yeah. think of human beings like little, little automata that have to be controlled by a master uh, elite of programmers from the top. These are transhumanists. Mm -hmm. And uh, this did a lot of damage to China, but China was also, they had nationalists and patriots who were uh, more astute than the Russian counterparts. They were able to expel Soros who never forgave them and kept control of their state banks. And and through that, they've been able to maintain um, a a, a type of, of operating system that's premised on an old, open not a closed system it, it like a you know a closed system means all of the limits are absolute you all you can do is fight for diminishing returns in a zero-sum game it's ent- mm-hmm. it's you know scientifically the term used is entropic mm-hmm. it's subjected to the second law of thermodynamics you cannot have more you light a match that fire is always going to be moving towards heat death <laughs> it's not going to make more fuel out of that match over time it'll have mm-hmm. less fuel to keep itself alive that's how these people think of human societies as, as systems that are that are like a fire that will always die down. And all you can do is consolidate power to reduce or prolongate as much as possible the inevitable heat death of the system. But they don't believe they hate, or maybe they believe, but they don't they see as an, a, a destabilizing and thus evil function human creativity that has a scientific power when it's being used well to discover things that are outside of the control of syst- the, the control system. Right, which we do when we discover electricity and apply that to humanity, to the productive process, all of a sudden we are potential to sustain more people at a higher quality of life with more access to our minds because machines can do the work of a thousand uh, slaves. All of a sudden we're, we're mentally and spiritually emancipated from the, the materialist forces and those who control those forces right, and the, and the resources, which mm-hmm. is what the empire always tries to do. So, you know, I think it's, it's important that people get into the, 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 the paradigm of, of a Chinese um, Confucian trying to preserve their ancient civilization. It's 5,000 plus years old, the Indians as well. You know, the, there, there's a reawakening, I think, of an appreciation of this open system concept of human nature and the obligation to conform your political economy and foreign policy around that scientifically demonstrable fact 
of our relationship to the universe and how our boundary conditions, unlike those of the animals, are relative and not absolute. You know, they're relative to mm -hmm. the discoveries we make or fail to make and apply to willfully modify our behavior, not, not have that behavior modified for us, but actually willfully in accordance with what our minds can discover to be true, which a good ed education system and culture should promote, which it doesn't uh, in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's just hard to get into that mindset because we live in such a cesspool of hypocrisy and lies. So it's hard to even imagine that something like the people would often hear what I say and they're like, no, you're an, ideal, <laughs> an idealized naive fool. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I think that is a, um, and, and I have said that it's also the problem that um, a lot of the discourse is, is, is becoming more and more Western centric. And even it's moving away from the countries like, for example, Syria, Yemen, Latin America, Lebanon, Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, that will very probably benefit from um, the Russia, China block with Iran and India and Pakistan in there pushing back against Western imperialism and supremacy and effectively leading us, we hope, uh, to a multipolar world and mm -hmm. one where, you know, these subjugated countries who've, I keep saying this, you know, we've been in, in Syria, they've been living the great set, the great reset for, for 12 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and anything um, that liberates these countries from the chains of imperialism is a good thing. And I support that. Um, but one, one other point, um, that I just wanted to cover because my electricity's just gone out. So my battery on my laptop's going to start oh, dying no. fairly soon, <laughs> okay. um, is we talked about, because, you know, just, just to, to, uh, reinforce the point that we're making, I think that, that, you know, Russia and China are not part of the western vision for a great reset which is destructive effectively it's it's the destruction of humanity in my view um and i have been arguing that that in 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 my belief covid 19 yes was a portal to all these elements of the great reset um and the the war against the working class against the little people um as as i call them <laughs> that's in their view of course um but i in 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 my view it was also the start of this this um major provocation against russia that has led to the situation we now have in ukraine and this global transformation not that i think that they wanted to to achieve the positive transformation i think they they wanted the the destruction of um, Russia as a, as a, for, from their point of view, a threatening global power. And we talked about what happened in January 2020, which of course was only a, a couple of months before the COVID project started in March, um, that there was a coup attempt in Russia. There was also the assassination of um, Qasem Soleimani uh, in Iraq by uh, Trump um and also in 2019 um america uh, renounced uh, the nuclear agreement i think it was the inf and the open sky agreements in 2019 and 2020 so there were a number of signs in my view that that this war against russia was incoming and of course the signs have been there for for decades but can you just talk about what you what you were talking about um what happened in january 2020 oh yeah that was such a a high density of singularities such mm. a, an inflection point in world history um you pointed out many of them um the the one of the the points i would have to say as well for context is that um in my assessment the mm. like the the deep state in the united states didn't get less like the pentagon the state department uh, the the military industrial complex didn't become like less independent since they killed jfk in 63 um if anything it's much more powerful even today than it was 50 years ago 
And uh, I don't see Trump necessarily. I think that Trump really was a bit of um, a chaos factor for the, <laughs> the, the mm. great resetters and not necessarily at the heart of a lot of the worst elements of his foreign policy. Um, I can back that up. Um, like, I do think he really did like Putin a lot. And I think Putin <laughs> liked him. I do think the same thing for when he went to China um, as a special guest um, at the Forbidden Palace, uh, Forbidden City. Um, there was, here's the thing. So I said I could back it up. So <laughs> the thing here with uh, January 2020 was also the Davos summit, whereby George Soros gave a very revealing speech where he said the two greatest threats to his open society was uh, Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative and Trump's USA as number one, number two. Um, the reason for that was that that was also the month, uh, January, I think, 5th, was the month that the U.S.-China trade deal, phase one, went into operation with the policy of the Chinese agreeing to buy $350 billion of U.S. finished goods as part of a rehabilitation of the destroyed U.S. industrial base that had been killed for 50 years of NAFTA and globalization. So Detroit, Philadelphia that, have, that are annihilated. The idea was really to re revive and retool those uh, former industrial hubs. So China was the key component. You couldn't do it without the Chinese market. It's it's the most robust growth model in the world, and China, and Trump knew that. So it was a multi. It was supposed to be a multi-phase operation: two, second phase, third phase, uh, many other things, which were very hopeful. And I think that's why people like George Soros was pissing his pants uh, about that prospect of that working out. COVID derailed all of that. Um, over the course of the next four or five months, it disintegrated um, increasingly mm. as Trump has a lot. I mean, he seemed to really buy into the briefings he was being given on uh, China's role in, in some of the stuff. It was insane. Not the brightest bulb on, on many levels. Um, the other thing with the near war with Iran that had happened when um, uh, January 3rd happened, Soleimani was killed by a U.S. Uh, strike as well as the, the lead negotiator in, in Iraq as well. Um, there, was, there was a whole meeting being set up uh, in Iraq um, between Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Iran, and the Iraqis were sort of the, the mediators. The, uh, the former prime minister, I think it was Mahdi, had said that it was Trump who had originally pushed to try to negotiate this brokering of, of some sort of an entente between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. Mahdi, who was, I think, a good guy, he was ousted. Um, from a, I believe, a Western-fueled uh, mass revolt. Um, he was a friend of the Belt, Belt and Road. He actually signed Iraq onto the BRI. Um, he recognized that the future of, of the Middle East, the survival is the, the Southern corridor of the BRI, moving through a, a, you know, and providing industrial economic uh, reconstruction to Syria, Iraq, Iran, everywhere else. So anyway, that was all he blamed Trump for it. He thought it was a trap that was set for him. I don't think that that's the case because after Soleimani was killed, uh, Trump immediately did get on the phone and had um, it was the embassy of uh, Switzerland that had since the 70s a, a direct channel from the White House. By, and he made sure to bypass the State Department where he was in direct communication with the Iranian leadership mm. with the, uh, the message, do not retaliate, just wait. And they had a, a full day of intense emergency negotiations over this red line. I think it was through like a fax machine in the, the Swiss embassy. Point is, there was a very controlled response, you know, like Iran provided their, their counterattack, their retaliation um, with four notice that gave the U.S. a chance to like remove their, their people from the military base. There was no in response uh, retaliation from the USA. It was a very controlled narrative that was created. Um, that, that's unprecedented mm. that there would be, you know that level of control of the response. And, you know, the Iranian military said, okay, uh, justice has been served, yada, yada. Um, but it does seem like there was something renegade. And I think when you look at the people like John Bolton, who Trump has fired, or, you know, Trump fired a lot of people. And I think that many of them, just like Putin has had to negotiate and keep people like, um, you know, I mentioned a few of them, Golikova, many others in positions of power, even Alexei Kudrin, who he had fired um, in 2011, has been brought back into a very po powerful position. A lot of them have we had, had a lot of the same things in the U.S. Except in the case of the U.S., it's a more controlled environment than than Russia. So I don't fully know all the details. I know that he did. He was happy to fire Bolton, and Bolton was quick to support the Democrats and the warmongers there. Um, Pompeo was no special thing at all. He was a disaster and always was. I don't think Trump necessarily wanted Pompeo in. I don't know, it, but again, I don't understand all the power structures that he was mm. he was negotiating with. All that to say. 
that was the month that, again, COVID was sprung on the world. Uh, the Chinese immediately began interpreting it like uh, U.S. bio bio lab attack. You had the the downing of a of a Ukrainian jet from that was flying out of Tehran mm. into Kiev on uh, I think it was the eighth of January as well, which the Iranians were induced to shoot down. It seems like that yeah. might have been. There's a few scenarios hypothesizing why. It seems that it, a cyber attack is one of the most likely things to induce the, the Iranian radar sensors to interpret it as an incoming missile. Mm -hmm. There's a few other scenarios that I've seen that are reasonable, but I'm not too sure which is, is actually true. All that to say, the Iranians chose at that time to uh, claim ownership for it. They, they felt that was the pathway to go. And um, what, what's interesting here is there's a lot of parallels to the 2014 sh shoot down of MH17 on so yeah. many levels. Um, in the case of MH17 earlier, you had its flight path moved from moving over across um, Crimea, which was the original flight path, to moving over the eastern Ukrainian region of Donbass. Um, we don't know exactly why that was done. We do know that there were certain um, individuals who were um, owned uh, employees, the dispatcher of the, the, the company or the contractor that carried out that command was an employee who worked for Igor uh, Kolomoskoy. We know that the plane, mm -hmm. MH17, was owned by a company uh, called, U or run by a company called Ukrainian International Airlines, whose main owner is Igor Kolomoskoy, <laughs> who we've already yeah. talked about, and you've talked about a lot as you know, yeah. the, the, the main funder of Azov's and these other Nazis. Zelensky. Um, and also Zelensky, I forgot to mention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there were a lot of strange things. And what was additionally strange is on January 15th, after Putin's State of the Union ad address, literally the day after, is where there was a near coup d'etat, it seems, in Russia, where the entire Russian government resigned. And it's not fully known what that was all about. But it seems like that was an, a part of a broader attempt to destabilize or undermine Putin. Um, Medvedev was a part of it at that time. And we know that somebody who has been positioned after the murder, you know, there was a murder of Mikhail Lesson, who was the former mm. editor in chief of uh, and founder of RT, Russia Today, in 2015 at the Washington offices or in Washington, he was murdered. Um, I think they called it a suicide, but yeah, I mean, there's so much evidence that this was not a suicide. Afterwards, his replacement who was brought in was this young, this girl who's like this social media obsessed a uh, creature named uh, Margarita Semyonin, who is mm. the current editor in chief. And she had really done something very indicative and strange at that same time, right after Ukraine, uh, Iran claims ownership of, of the, the shoot down by accident of their, of the Ukrainian jet, mm. a passenger jet killing, I think it was 200 something people. She all of a sudden goes on Twitter, on her Twitter account, and starts saying, now Putin should take a lesson and man up and claim ownership for the MH17 uh, flight that was shot down over Donbass, um, <laughs> which immediately was amplified in Bloomberg Press, all of the Western media, BBC and CNN, everything was amplifying this mass perception that, you know, RT is supposed to be the voice of Putin, the voice of Russia. Um, it... it it actually was all coordinated with that same uh, coup d'etat attempt. And I got to say, like, there, there's definitely good high value content in RT. I use it or I was using mm. it when I could still access it. Um, however, there's also this other thing, which sometimes puts out psyops too. you know, the, the yeah. extra emphasis on alien disclosure that they sometimes throw in acting like it's real news or mm. the, uh, the COVID, uh, uh, fear porn, which was yeah, high yeah. amplitude in, in RT, or even mm -hmm. giving traitors like uh, Alexei Kudrin, the former finance minister who Putin had fired via Medvedev in 2011 for being a traitor, um, they've been giving him a, a high a high value platform to spread his market gospel, um, criticizing Putin for being a nationalist and pushing always for supporting the bank of the Bank of Russia's policy of maintaining an IMF floating exchange rate speculative orientation and withholding funds that would otherwise be able to go for the growth and development of Russia the way China is doing. So this RT thing has, is, has a lot of good in it, but there's also evidence that came out in that period in January of this other thing um, as well, mm. which again, it's just to appreciate the nuance 
of it all. That we can't just label things so easily with a black or white, but appreciate the nuance. The fact that Putin did survive that uh, attempted coup is uh, is interesting. But uh, the, the the whole two year period has been a surreal, intense period in world history coming out of that, when a lot of potential was undone during that time. You know, the U.S. Trump, who had been pretty much bogged down as being a Russian stooge under Russiagate, <laughs> completely made up for the whole time that, you know, he was in there up until then. The last year of his presidency was just dealing with psyops of COVID, and he didn't get that much done. A lot of good things that could have happened didn't happen. And then there was a Soros funded uh, and other uh, coup d'etat, which resulted in a recontrol or a take back of control by these Rhodes Scholars around mm. uh, Obama and Biden, who have now, you know, the whole team has been back in power now for uh, for over a year and yeah. uh, going back to their same operations and then some to the extreme. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I just I, I think it's it's important to keep the nuance of Trump as well in mind because it's such a um, people tend to, again, get very polarized around the word and, <laughs> and not appreciate the, <laughs> the degree of messiness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I think, um, Matt, thank you again. I mean, I would, I would love to keep talking, but I'm aware that I've taken up a lot of your time and, um, my laptop is literally going to conk out in about pleasure vanessa anytime you want to talk more we'll talk more and I've yeah a, i've completely lost track of time i've got another interview in two minutes so you're your okay you better go is- <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasure all right Matt. take care and thank you so much take care bye 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 <laughs>